Hey friends, Karen Pennington here. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, whatever time of the day you're listening to this. Morning for me. <laughs> you know, I sometimes as I seek out God's daily grace, I will go through something silly, big, small, and that'll remind me of a scripture, and that's sort of how I approach it. I'll study the scripture or reference the scripture, and sometimes as I'm reading through my daily scripture readings, it reminds me of something in life. So it kind of goes both ways. That's that illustration thing. But today I was reading a fairly famous scripture verse and it reminded me of this silly little thing that happened oh six or seven years ago when I visited the Brooklyn Tabernacle. I absolutely adore the Brooklyn Tabernacle. It has a world famous choir. Uh, it has a wonderful, very humble, but well-known pastor who seeks out to help other pastors, struggling pastors, and um, he just has a wonderful story. He's a wonderful writer. Uh, he's kind of a celebrity in my mind. I read a book by Jim Cimbala, who is the uh, lead pastor of the Brooklyn Tabernacle. He, it's called Fresh Wind, Fresh Fire. It was a best-selling book. It talked about his journey of prayer and how prayer and leaning into God is really the source of what makes the Brooklyn Tabernacle such a thriving ministry and he constantly is talking about the struggle as well and how that helps him lean into God it's uh, just the whole outlook has been really a wonderful thing for me uh, and his sermons just the honesty of his sermons and the struggle and God meeting him in a struggle really have defined a lot helped define my own faith at a time that was absolutely absolutely horrible for me I would just listen to a sermon of his every day. I ran out of sermons to listen to because he only preached once a week. And every once in a while, someone else preached or at least got posted up there. So I I just almost exhausted his library of sermons because every day I was just crying out to God and looking for words of relief and wisdom and encouragement and even challenge. And this came in great part through this pastor, Jim Cimbala. So when I got the chance to go to one of those world-famous prayer meetings... I went. It, it wasn't a big one. It was a Tuesday morning one, which meant that it was there were only you know two hundred people there instead of twelve hundred. And so I say all this because at the end of the, I was a little starstruck. I got to pray right next to him. I almost prayed at his feet. I was. <laughs> it was so silly. I'm. I didn't have a crush on him. He's you know older than me. Married. I'm married. I like my husband, but I was almost sort of like awestruck. Because here was this person who spoke in so much life, who God had worked so many things through, who still, unlike so many people, unfortunately, managed to maintain his my humility, his identity in Christ, his connection to his family. And I just love that example. I loved his words. I loved his witness. And I got to pray in the same room as him. <laughs> it's like, and I actually prayed. I was like, I couldn't have done this in the night in the early prayer meeting that I was in, the 12 o'clock prayer meeting. I was like right next to him, feet away from him. And I'm praying and I'm talking to God. And I'm also thinking, I'm right next to Jim Cimbala. It's like I was meeting the president or some rock star or something. And then right at the end, he gave his word um, from the Lord. And we prayed a little more together. And at the end, he said, hug somebody. So I immediately, I was yards away from him and there was no security. So I immediately ran up and hugged him really tight, probably too tightly because I was just so excited to meet him. And um, then I walked away and my daughter, who she was fairly young back then, I think she was like 11 or 12. She had, um, she was there. She was kind of playing on her little iPad during the whole long meeting because I took her with me and she's like, mom, you were like a teenager who met a rock star. <laughs> Evidently, I am such a Bible geek that my idea of a rock star is to meet a preacher. So she's like, you were starstruck. And I mean, it, she was kind of laughing at it because it wasn't like in the sense of usually when you meet a rock star, you're like, you know, you have a crush. I, I didn't have a crush on him, but I was just so excited to meet him. I'd be like meeting a president, either gender or meeting you know, the, just this person that, a famous author, and he was a famous author, so I had a right to, you know, think he was a celebrity. I did find out later, I don't know if I'm the reason that he did this, but as I <laughs> listened to his sermons later on, um, really from that point forward, I heard him say, ladies, hug a lady, gentlemen, hug a gentleman. So I'd sort of, I, I felt a little bad because I broke a personal boundary because he's very big 
this particular preacher, part of the reason he maintains his humility is because he maintains his boundaries. So he tries to be very careful about, especially hugging strangers, that you're not, women aren't hugging men and creating, you know, the wrong kind of connections or hugging the wrong way or, you know, starting something. I'm usually very, very careful about how I hug men who aren't relatives of mine. I do the side hug, you know, and, but I'll, I don't think I did with him. I think I just went for it full on like I was hugging a da- my daddy or something. <laughs> and he's about the, the age my father would be. And <laughs> so I, I, it was just so, I was so awestruck. And it was like, <laughs> I, I just thought it was so funny because my daughter was like, it was like you were a teenager who met a rock star. <laughs> so my rock star is a 70 something year old preacher um you know who covers himself all the time is madly in love with his wife and that's part of the stuff i love because i love it when pastors still maintain the integrity of their marriage and their family because that's important to me too Uh, so uh smitten no awestruck definitely (laughs) and if i did it again i may not hug him but i'd certainly talk to him and shake his hand or something uh just because i I just love, love who he is. And um, I'd almost be embarrassed if he's listening to this, but I don't care. <laughs> you might remember me, Jim Cimbala. I'm the crazy lady who several years ago, a girl during the week of Lent came up and hugged you tight. And maybe I'm the reason that you were very specific about boys hugging boys and girls hugging girls. I don't know. But um, I am going somewhere with this. I was reading today a pretty famous passage, actually, in Luke. And... It kind of follows a progression in Jesus' ministry. It, it starts with him sending out the, the 12. And this is Luke 9. And he sends out the 12 and, you know, his power is so great that he was able to lay his authority upon them, as God does on us, because Jesus is God. You know, he laid his support, the authority upon them and they were able to go out and do incredible things. They said to heal the sick in this case. uh, There are other scriptures and other gospels that talk about even raising the dead, that they were doing these amazing things in Christ's name. And um, there are other scriptures that talk about Jesus saying, you know, these things you see me doing, you're going to do even greater things in my name uh, because that's how great his authority is. And um, so popular was this, his ministry and his authority the authority that he could impart even on other people and the things that people could do even in his name when he wasn't there that it got up to to Herod um who's you know the ruler they call it the tetrarch he was the ruler of that area and it confused him and it sort of thrilled him and it was like this can't be John Herod had killed John he'd beheaded him and so Herod it didn't say Herod wanted to kill him it says you know in Luke 7 Nine, that Herod wanted to meet him. And later on, when Herod does meet him, Herod is even a little bit, seems a little awestruck, like, ooh, so tell me a little bit more about yourself, you know? (laughs) He was intrigued. Even the ruler of the area was intrigued. And then it talks about how Jesus tried to get away, the the next passage is Jesus tried to get away by himself. And so... He had all these crowds following him. 5,000 men. Now, 5,000 men, this could translate to 15, 20,000 people altogether because they brought their families, you know? And so men, women, and children, we're, we're not talking about like a big, a big city in our terms of a city. In Jamestown, New York, which is where I live, if you get 15,000 people following you, half the town is next to you. So we're thinking about that back in the Bible days. These are smaller cities. So we're talking about like half the town <laughs> the equivalent of half the town's population maybe or or you know a very large portion of the town came and followed him he was famous basically probably more people were, were around him than anywhere else in that even region at that time that was a gathering that was a a, a coliseum event you got 15 20 thousand people around you you fill the stadium at least a a small one, maybe not a big one, but a small one. And he, they came after him. And why did they come after him? Did that? Who did they think he was? That's a good question, right? Actually, it's the question that he asks in the next passage. So these people come to him. They probably come to him maybe to be thrilled, to be amazed, to see who is this guy, uh, to tell him how great he is, to listen to what he has to say. I mean, 
think about it. When the president comes to down, some people go visit the president even if they don't like him just to see I saw the president. If a ruler or a royal from England comes to town, we want to see him because we want to meet somebody famous. We want to be thrilled. Um, an author, uh, you know, pe- anyone who's famous, we want to see this famous person. And especially if they're famous and entertaining. And he must have been pretty entertaining because they listened to him long enough to miss a meal. And then on top of that, he fed them. He fed them like we're not talking about a little tiny dieter's portion of a meal. He fed them as much as they could eat and so much that there was probably 12 times as much left over than what he started with. He did a miracle and he fed it. So we got somebody who's kind of like him. This is like going to Vegas and going to D.C. and going to a really good meal all at once, all for free. Right. So <laughs> that's who Jesus was. Right. At least maybe it's, it's who it was to them. And so a little bit later, the very next passage, after he thrills them, he amazes them, he wows them, he gives them miracles. He gives them a great show and a great teaching if they were listening and a great meal. Uh, Jesus prayed and he was by himself and he asked the disciples an important question. He said, and this is Luke 9, 18. Who do the crowds say that I am? Who do they say that I am? Why are they following me? It's a good question, right? Why are they following me? Um, they answered, John the Baptist, others Elijah, still others, the ancient prophets who've come back to life. Who do the crowd say I am? They say you're famous. They say you're a miracle worker. They say you're a great man who does great things. I heard something new in the translation of that this morning, just in my spirit. When he's saying, who do they say I am? Why are they following me? Are they following me? For a good show? Are they following me for a thrill? Are they following me? Heck, that good meal. (laughs) That was just a bonus, right? Free dinner with the show. And then he asked them, what about you? Who do you say that I am? Pennington translation? Karen Pennington translation? Why are you following me? Why are you following me? And uh, Peter says, you're the Christ sent from God. Christ, anointed one. That word Christ or Messiah, same word, two languages, means anointed one. You're the one. And that, of course, is an allusion to prophets who were anointed, kings who were anointed, when you were set apart by God to do an amazing, miraculous thing, to lead to exhibit God's power and authority. Then they often poured oil on your head as a sign of being set apart. And that's what the word anointed means, to to have oil on your head, to be set apart. We know you're special, God. We know you've been set apart. And not just a anointed one, because a lot of people got anointed the anointed one. Historically, that would mean this is the person in the line of David David being the king who built up Israel's borders beyond any other king. The great king of Israel, the one after God's own heart, the one who established the kingdom before all the other kings messed it up. (laughs) The one who made the kingdom go so far that it actually extended into the borders of what was once Egypt. The borders of what was once that area where the Israelites were slaves to Egypt, that became an area that they owned and had overtaken from Egypt. So much that David did. And you're that. But you're also like Elijah, that prophet who did these miracles that were unspeakable. Between Elijah and Elisha, they fed people. They multiplied bread, not like Jesus did. Elijah went to heaven without dying, went up in a whirlwind. Elisha, they said, inherited a double portion of Elijah's spirit. So he did twice as many good things and powerful things as Elijah did. And they're like, you're that. I mean, they say you're that, but we know you're going to be ruling and you're going to be in your greatness, greatness, greatness. And Jesus' response was not good. Go tell everybody. You know, isn't that interesting? 
He said, the son of man, or this translation, the human one, must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, chief priests, and legal experts and be killed and raised on the third day. What he said before that is, don't tell anybody. You think he was trying to hide who he was? No. Don't tell anybody. Listen. Yeah, I'm not stuff. But I don't think I'm who you think I am. I'm not who you think I am. Yes, I'm the Messiah. Yes, I'm a great prophet. Yes, I can do all the things that Elijah and Elisha and the great prophets did. Yes, I'm the fulfillment of what John the Baptist said. But I'm more. And I require more. Listen. I'm going to bring in a rain of power like you can't imagine. But it's not the way you think. As they're talking about the person who's going to overtake, in their mind, the Messiah who's going to overtake the government and throw down, you know, everything. The great and powerful leader, he says, I'm going to suffer. I'm going to be rejected. I'm going to be killed before I'm raised up. That human part of me, the son of man, that's going to happen. That's got to happen first. Then he says something that you hear over and over again. It just struck me new today. Now, the translation I'm used to, 923, is if anyone comes after me, he must deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. I've switched translations because newer translations uh, follow this faithfully without using that he language because it's really he or she. It's any of us. I'm not exempt from this because I'm a woman. Here's what this translation says. Luke 9.23, and this is the Common English Bible. All who want to come after me must say no to themselves. Take up their cross daily and follow me. I was always struck by take up their cross daily. Because see, Jesus hadn't been executed yet. He hadn't even been charged yet. At this point, people are following him because they think he's going to usher in this new thing. They think he's the celebrity. <laughs> like this nerdy Bible nerd who's talking right now saw this pastor as celebrity. They wanted to be close to him. They wanted to be touch, touch him. They wanted to be around his greatness and be in awe and thrilled and receive anything that he could give them and be elevated above the common and be elevated above their problems. And he's saying, listen, if you want to follow me, you're going to suffer. You got to be willing to do that. You have to be willing to march into the suffering if that's where I take you. If God names it, we can claim it, right? Sometimes we claim things. Often. We claim things that God has never, ever promised. We claim that we will have all kinds of money and no problems. God does promise riches. Not earthly. Is it all right to go for it? Fine, if it doesn't take you away from God. But that's, we claim that we will not have any trouble. When Jesus said, in this world you have troubles, but I have overcome the world. We claim that all our relationships will just be perfect and whole. Sometimes we'll follow after the wrong person. A person that we know does not follow the Lord and we'll just decide, oh, God will anoint it. God doesn't say that. You know, there's some problems sometimes. And not only do they come when we're trying to avoid them because we don't have complete control over this life, God does. Sometimes... God calls us to march right into them. There are nations. We know of nations right now. In the Middle East, where marching after Christ means marching into death. If you refuse to deny Christ, you've just bought a ticket to heaven today. 
Sometimes we're still in physical danger when we choose to make a stand. Sometimes we lose jobs, even in this country. Sometimes we go to jail. Jesus isn't a rock star. He's kind of cool. <laughs> He's kind of famous. He can be very entertaining. But that kind of begged the question for me, who was Jesus to me? Just like I thought about this guy, Jim Cimbala, you know, he's, who was he to me? He's great. He's kind of a rock star. He's kind of really cool. He's an example, an earthly example that points me beyond myself to God. But who is Christ for first and foremost to me? Who do I say that he is? Do I wallow in the fact that he brings victory? That's great. That's good. But is he more than that? I'm excited when I go to church and I'm entertained and just can lose myself in worship. Absolutely. But do I take joy? Do I take a thrill in marching after Christ even when it's hard? Even when people don't know? Even when people can't know that what I'm doing is right? Even when, and this has happened, because of my integrity, there are people out there that will twist it just like they did with Paul in the New Testament, just like they did with the disciples. And they'll take the very people who are being honest and set them up as being dishonest. They'll twist their words. They'll make you seem to be the exact opposite of what you are. Take up your cross daily. That was the cross piece, stauros in, in, in Greek, that you would do and you would march after the centurion or wherever as you go up. And that that's the cross piece that was the... The straight piece, the vertical piece, was already put in the ground, and they would nail you up. To, um, this is crazy because people didn't know that Jesus was going to his death on a cross yet, so they didn't realize how real this was. This is what really struck me. I, I've just started, I've switched my normal daily devotions to Common English Bible. And here's what this translation says. Jesus said to everyone, all who want to come after me must say no to themselves. Take up their cross daily and follow me. I always like the bigger context, but in this case, I think the smaller phrase really is what strikes me. All who want to come after me must say no to themselves. No to themselves. And that is a challenge for me. challenge for all of us. Who is Christ to us? First and foremost, first and foremost, is he our rock star? First and foremost, is he the one that gives us what we want or what we need? First and foremost, is he our savior? First and foremost, is he our leader? See, the one who we follow because we know he's all these other things, so he's worthy. I would challenge myself and all of us today, but what an important question this is. Who Christ really, really is to us is what defines how we live for him. If he's just your savior, If it's just a get-out-of-jail-free card, not only do we miss what he deserves from us, but we miss the blessings of a surrendered life to him. If he's just our provider, then God becomes our vending machine instead of an int We miss the intimacy of connecting with him. If he's just somebody who barks orders at us, and we just have to answer, then we miss the joy. We miss the joy. And we end up surrendering to some sort of weird sense of guilt or shame instead of living freely the way God would have us live. Maybe he's all these things. Maybe he's none of these things, but to you. But I, 
I want to serve a God who to me is everything. I want to serve a God to where when I read this verse, all who want to come after me must say no to themselves. I realize saying no to my everything is like saying no to this tiny, tiny bank account. Tiny, almost minuscule bank account and giving that up, saying no to everything I am so that I can have everything that God wants for me. Saying death to me so I can live life in Christ. I'm still discovering that every day. Every day it's a journey. Every day it's an adventure. Some days it's hard. Every day it's worth it. If you don't know that, I want to invite you to that too. If you do know that, I invite you to keep going. Let's journey together. Every day is grace. Every day to live is Christ and to die is gain. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, I thank you for your truth. I thank you for the way you take these scriptures, these scriptures that we hear over and over and over again and your word is so living and active you breathe new life into them lord i thank you for the people in the light in our lives even that we are kind of in awe of but lord may we not stop there may they just point us to you and being in awe of you that sense of wonder is such a beautiful thing lord and it's it's wonderful to feel that as a kid at christmas or to be in the presence of someone you really respect or admire God, may we see, or the Grand Canyon, or anything, Lord. May we never lose that sense of wonder of who we are, of who you are in us, Lord. And along with that childlike sense of wonder, may we have that childlike sense of faith where we're willing to give everything. Just not blind faith. Obedient faith. Because we know what you have is so much better than us. Help us to say no not just faithfully, but joyfully every day because saying no to us and saying yes to do you means we get the better deal. Bless us, guide us, and be glorified in our lives today. In your name, amen. And be blessed today and may you discover the joy of the Lord in new and wonderful ways even as you let go of you. May you be filled tenfold and more so with the love and presence of God.